Hi, everybody. Welcome to our Facebook video. We are talking today about the Chesapeake Kids Program at Hospice of the Chesapeake, and I am joined by a child life specialist, Alex Harich. So, Alex, thanks for coming to talk to me today about Chesapeake Kids Program. Absolutely. I'm happy to be here. So, I think probably one of the hardest things ever for a parent to hear would be that their child has a life-limiting illness or a life-limiting condition. I can't, I, I haven't had that experience, but I can only imagine that that's really hard to hear. If that were to happen to a family, can you talk a little bit about the Chesapeake Kids Pediatric Hospice Program and, and sort of what, what that would help with? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I would just say that a lot of times people don't know um, that when pediatric patients are on a hospice service, they can be continuing to seek curative treatments and therapies while they're still on our hospice service. So we've had patients in the past still getting radiation, still getting chemo um, and things like that. So we tell families all the time that joining hospice isn't giving up hope. Um, it just ends up being usually a change in their goals. Um, but at that time, we just try to remind them that it's still possible to still get treatments and still do these therapies that they've been doing for so long. Um, or even if something new pops up, they might want to add that into their treatment plan. So I think that that's a huge distinct distinction, especially between pediatric and adult, that you're able to still be going and getting treatments and trying to fight the right. illness or the disease and, and, but yet benefit yeah. from all of the support that a pediatric hospice program like Chesapeake Kids can offer. Right. So then we just remind them while they're still doing that, we are their comprehensive team that's providing that extra layer of support while they're at home. Um, so they might still be going to the hospital for doctor's appointments or treatments um, and things like that. But the interdisciplinary team that includes the nurse, the pediatric coordinator, myself, um, the social worker, our chaplain, um, and our doctor, we're all still there providing support um, and providing that support 24-7. Um, so we have on-call nurses all the time that are available to be reached by phone um, that these patients and families can reach out to for our support. Um, and we just try to reach the whole family with that support. So with the team that I just mentioned, um, we're providing psychosocial support, emotional support, spiritual support, um, but also that physical support. So answering questions about medications or new symptoms and pain management and things like that. So we try to reach every single part of not only the patient, but the family and the unit as a whole. So siblings, caregivers, um, anyone really involved in the care of the patient. That's amazing. And, and just to be clear, that, that doesn't take over for their primary either provider, pediatric provider or specialist right. team. That's in addition to mm -hmm. all. Okay. Yeah, so a huge part of our job is collaborating with their current medical team. Um, a couple months ago, we had um, one of our nurses really set up one of those coordinating um, meetings. So we did a Zoom meeting with their primary care team, the family, um, and our whole team to make sure that everybody's on the same page. Um, and we want to make sure that their medical team is updated with any changes that we make. Um, and they update us with any changes that they're making um, to make sure that there's really a common set of goals, I think is the most important thing. But yeah, just really making sure that whole package, the whole care is cohesive and having another set of medical professionals in on that, I can, I can think that that would be really helpful. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that a lot of our patients and families really benefit from it um, and seeing that as professionals, we can all work together towards those same goals um, and really helping the family set those goals. So the medical team sees them a lot more in their like crisis settings, right. um, but then our team sees them day to day at home, kind of in their family setting. So in a more like relaxed setting that they're more themselves, if that makes sense. Yeah. And, and probably even bigger picture, right? Like you're, you're, just the way healthcare is set up, your primary care provider or specialist has a short window to see you in their, you know, for scheduling. Mm -hmm. This sounds a little bit broader and, and yeah. Fuller. So we talk all the time, like I said, about treating the whole family and the whole patient. So seeing them in all aspects of their day to day and their life um, and including the whole family in the care plan. Yeah, because that's because it's not just the patient, especially for a pediatric for a child. There's there's so many yeah aspects to that. So, what type of um, of what can who could the program help? What type of conditions or what type of, of 
illnesses kind yeah, of absolutely. Do you guys so um Chesapeake Kids in general serves kids from birth up to age 21 um, in Anne Arundel or Prince George's County. So um, any child that has a life-limiting illness, this can include lung disease, heart disease, cancer, tumors, um, genetic and metabolic diseases and anomalies, um, anything that you can think of that a medical professional would um, describe as life-limiting. I'll see those. Okay. You, we mentioned a little bit at the beginning, sort of your title as Chesapeake, um, or as Child Life Specialist for the Chesapeake Kids Program. What, tell me, tell me about that. Tell me about your role as, um, as a Child Life Specialist. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so my role here is a lot of psychosocial and emotional support. Um, as we discussed before, it's not just for the patient, um, but also for siblings, parents, caregivers, um, and really the family that's completely a part of the care team. Um, so I'm doing a lot of education for patients and families and siblings um, on what is this disease, what does it mean, what does it look like, um, how is it going to affect the patient and family, um, and where can we go moving forward, if that makes sense. So not just diagnosis, but also prognosis. Um, having those difficult conversations can be huge. I've coached some families, like parents and grandparents, aunts and uncles, um, through how to talk to their kids, um, language that can be used, um, because using developmentally appropriate language can be huge in helping patients, families, siblings just really understand everything that's going on. Um, so a ton of my job is assessment um, and meeting families where they're at. So kind of asking, how can I help you today? Right. In this moment, where are you right now? What are your questions? Um, and where do you want to be in the future, if that makes sense? Um, yeah. Helping them understand what they want to know and what they want their kids to know. Um, and answering everything in kind of that open and honest way. So my team and I have such strong feelings about open and honest communication, um, which can be huge in all of these settings. Um, well, especially because it's such a, it's, I would think it's such a stressful time, right? Just to have like, to have somebody that can help you navigate those right. conversations because Absolutely. you're so stressed out over, over what's happening, you know? That's yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, so I become kind of like an educator, an advocate, a supporter. Um, and then another part of my job is memory making and legacy building. Um, so making kind of art projects that could be used later on that might be kind of that legacy building, something that they made um, that the parents might cherish later on in life. Right now, it might not seem like that big of a deal, um, but really working on those projects that could be helpful um, further down the line, um, something that I've done. Can in you give an example? What's So what would be like a legacy Type yeah. of project. Um, so like I said, something as simple as an art project could suffice. Um, so handprints, footprints, things like that for a lot of our infants can be really helpful. Um, but another thing that I did recently was a memory jar with one of our older patients. So we mm -hmm. sat down and talked about some of her favorite memories. Um, and we had a nice glass mason jar and she picked out the colors of the paper slips and the gel pens that we used to write it. Um, and we helped, like we spent time talking about them. Um, and our next step was to put pictures with those memories. So her mom was gonna go through scrapbooks and see what pictures she could find to go kind of match up with those memories. Um, for that one, it became a lot more of a life review mm -hmm. as well. Um, so all of these things that I do, I feel like are really meshed together. So you touched a little bit on it about some of the programs for not just for the patient, but for the family themselves. Can you right. talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, for sure. Um, so for the siblings, we have grief groups. Um, I personally run the preteen group, but we also have Stepping Stones um, and the Phoenix group as well. So these grief groups meet once a month on a Wednesday evening. Um, I personally do the ones in Pasadena. I think that there is one in Largo as well, though. Um, and we spend time doing usually hands-on activity um, that kind of meshes with the topic about grief. Um, so just for an example, back in the fall, we did slime. So we talked about the different parts of slime, um, how everyone's slime ended up looking different um, and how it was really messy to make it um, and talking about how that really kind of correlates to grief in general. Everybody's grief looks different. Everybody's has different parts that make it up. Um, and we all just kind of go through the process differently, if that makes sense. So. We have those groups. Um, I also collaborate with the Chesapeake Life Center in general um, to kind of set families up with counseling. So we have individual counseling, we have family counseling. Um, we have the summer camps that will hopefully happen this year. Yeah, fingers crossed. <laughs> huge for siblings. Um, and then also we have our holiday adopt a family program that's been really helpful. This last year it was such a success. Um, we had seven or eight families that were adopted and had 
great holiday seasons because of it. Um, and lastly, we have our annual remembrance ceremony that happens every year. Um, it'll be in the fall this year. Um, and we just kind of take the time to really acknowledge those patients and families that have previously been on our service um, and just go through the nice ceremony together and give the families a time to come back and see the staff um, and just kind of remember Great their nice. child. Yeah, yeah. So I'm sure you've got a lot of stories or things that have impacted you while you've been in this role. Can you, and I know you need to be aware of patient privacy and confidentiality, but is there some, some, something that really resonates with you or some story that you could share that, that kind of has stuck with you? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so my background as a child life specialist has been pretty varied. Um, I've been in outpatient and inpatient settings um, and a huge part of my job in general as a child life specialist and when working with pediatrics is to be an advocate um, so I've learned in this role um, that families can be huge advocates for their patients, for their children. Um, so just in general, we had a younger patient who was on service who needs a lot of equipment and a lot of services and other things like that. And the family has really taken it upon themselves to reach out and educate themselves on everything that's possible. Um, they've asked us a ton of questions about, can you guys provide this? If not, where do you think we could get it from? Um, mm -hmm. And they also just utilize all their local resources. So physical therapy, occupational therapy, things like that, um, that have been huge for their child. Um, seeing them really use all their resources has been really inspiring for me just in general to see how hard some of these families work to get the best of the best for their child and do the best that they can. Um, something similar that I've learned um, and saw happen was that we had an older teenager on service um, and her mom really worked to be an advocate for the patient to have her own voice. So asking her to make her own choices in her treatment plan, um, what she wanted to do in the future, what she wanted to see um, happen and things like that. So not only seeing parents be advocates for their children, but advocate for their, advocate for their children to have their own voices. To have their own voice, yeah, that's kind of be, and I'm sure, I mean, that, that would be inspirational to just kind of, you know, see that process and, and know, that you're sort of a part of that, right? Like you're, you're, you're a piece of that puzzle that you're kind of helping Absolutely. educate and inform. That's great. So um, paying for this type of, of service, because it sounds like there's a lot provided. Um, how do people pay for the Chesapeake Kids program? Um, so the majority of our patients either um, utilize private insurance or have Medicaid. Um, and then the other part comes from donations. So okay. we utilize those three things to really help um, supplement our services for patients and families. So the donations could help if somebody doesn't have insurance or doesn't have much insurance. So, okay. Yeah. Right. So donations go to help our patients who are, like you said, uninsured or underinsured um, to help make sure that they get the medication they need, the equipment that they need, um, and really help supplement our services in general. That's huge. And so then in addition to making a donation, someone could also volunteer to, to help? Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so volunteer opportunities. If it's not a monetary donation, I think volunteering is a great place to start. Um, so they can volunteer to help with camp. They can volunteer to help with some of our grief groups. Um, they can volunteer to do healing touch, art therapy, music therapy, um, pet therapy, things like that um, can be really helpful and really supplement the work that our pediatric team does. Um, and part of my role is helping set up those volunteers with families. Um, and helping to coordinate to figure out which volunteer is best for which family um, and to really help them find out the best way to meet those needs. Yeah, that's huge. Wow. Thank you so much for taking time to talk with me today. I really appreciate it, Alex. Absolutely. And I do want to make sure to thank the John and Kathy Belcher Institute for their generous support of the community education programs at Hospice of the Chesapeake. And thank you guys for watching.